Winter driving means snow tires, right? Not anymore. And we'll tell you why this week on Motoring 98. TSN's Motoring 98 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas for new longer lasting performance friction carbon metallic brake pads. With a population of 400,000, Luxembourg may be the smallest country in Western Europe, but it is small in size only. This country and the city of Luxembourg has become a major financial powerhouse with over 240 banks from 175 different countries in the city alone. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 98. You know, Luxembourg is also a major international community. In fact, over 51% of the population come from another country. And you know, it's not unusual for residents here to speak three or four different languages. Well, one visitor that dropped in about 50 years ago was the Goodyear Tire Company, and the company stayed. And this week, we're going to visit its biggest tech development center outside of the United States, and then we're going to head into the Swiss Alps for some serious cold weather testing. For 100 years, Goodyear has been the front runner in developing tires. But today, the world has up to 40 tire manufacturers and a more educated consumer. To be ahead of your main competitor, you have to really invest a lot of effort, if I may say so, in, uh, in, in, in the technology and being uh, uh, assured that you really concerning technology always a little bit ahead of your competition. It wasn't until the 80s that tire companies began developing friction tires for winter. Back then, we called them snow tires. Today, they're known as winter tires. The difference between a winter tire and a summer tire is mainly in the compound, which performs much better at lower temperatures than a standard summer tire. If you're talking about temperatures below 10 degrees centigrade, the winter tire performs much better and is much safer. So even if you live in an area where there is no snow, but the temperatures do drop, a winter tire is much safe and absolutely required. We now take you to the Swiss Alps. It's here that Goodyear is introducing its new winter tires manufactured in Europe. The Eagle Ultra Grip and Ultra Grip 5. Now with the exception of Motoring 98, all the Canadian journalists were from the province of Quebec, which didn't come as a surprise. No, because the largest market in Canada is in Quebec or eastern Canada now. They sell more winter tires per capita but almost anywhere in North America. They can, that's why there's a lot of interest. The, the development of tires has changed to the point that now we understand that we need winter tires and not necessarily snow tires. Uh, like where we live in Montreal or in Quebec, we have a lot of ice more than we got snow. I believe really today uh, the winter tires we have uh, are really very high level. Uh, we are coming now close to a studded tires. There's so much effort from all of the company in this segment to perform well with winter tires. That could create some demand too. Because now people are very well informed, they, they know what's good tire in winter condition and they want it. Acceleration braking test is really a very difficult test. So uh, the driver here is really a specialist of this test. It's a very special test. It's, it's easy, it's not spectacular, but very important for us. Uh, it basically gives you the potential of grip on snow on the flat area. And uh, the acceleration and the potential for acceleration and braking, so the grip of the tire is really assessed in this test. It's definitely the test which gives us the most uh, interesting information on the tire. 
Today the conditions are not very good because uh, we had sun during the whole day so the ice is very slippery. But definitely this is a type of ice we can encounter on the open road. So definitely we have also to test on this type of ice. But in the morning of course at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning we have different type of ice. And we have to test in all these conditions, uh, make an average and try to see uh, what type of compounds we have to develop uh, because the compound is very important. So it's always a compromise and we are developing basically tyres which are compromised and to be able to, to be the best in all the conditions. For people which really are exposed to, uh, to winter condition and people which are afraid to run on an on a, on a icy road because they are afraid to sleep, they, they really need to, to put a winter task on the vehicle. The beetle finished, you know, then we were thinking about what, what the replacement could be. But, but nobody could, could put it into, you know, so what would that be? Whether it's a wintry wonderland like Whistler BC or just a more challenging access road to your cottage, Lexus hope that you're going to choose their latest, the RX300, to challenge the terrain. Does it cut the mustard and should it be on your list? We intend to find out. The RX's strongest asset is that it is technically advanced in just about every area. Beneath the hood sits a 3-litre double overhead cam 24-valve V6 that's good for 220 horsepower and 222 pounds-feet of torque at 4400 RPM. The all-wheel drive system is advanced, featuring a viscous center coupling. Under normal circumstances, the torque split is 50-50 front to rear. Now, should either axle lose traction, the viscous coupling shuttles the power in a transparent manner to the one with grip. To further improve traction, Lexus offers an optional Torsen Limited Slip Rear Differential, an option worth the extra dosh. Well, the RX300 isn't that bad off-road. Two things conspire against it from going into the really gnarly stuff. First of all, it comes equipped with mud and snow street radials. The second thing, there is no low-range gear set. You know, the curious part about the RX not having a low-range gear set is that its competition does namely the ML320 and the high-end Jeep Grand Cherokees. Now admittedly, if you buy this vehicle primarily for the four-wheel drive system as a safety aspect, no problem. But if you need to pull a large boat out of the lake, you're going to need that low-range gear set. Married to the all-wheel drive is a four-speed automatic that has to rank as one of the best offered on any vehicle anywhere in the world. Not only are the shifts smooth and seamless, they are fast without being abrupt. No sooner do you move the gas pedal than the gearbox has dropped out of overdrive and into third, bringing the engine to the boil. Despite my reservations in the backwards, when you get out on the highway, you really appreciate this vehicle for what it is. The engine is strong, the four-wheel drive system very refined, and the ride, well, it doesn't come much better in this category of car. Being based upon a unibody platform as opposed to a truck-derived chassis, the RX is noticeably smoother than other SUVs. Indeed, it is devoid of the characteristic buckboard-like ride that is the hallmark of many sports utes. The fully independent McPherson strut suspension also contributes to the well-mannered behavior. Likewise for the speed-sensitive rack and pinion steering. The response to input is particularly worthy of note because unlike many SUVs, it delivers a crisp feel, meaning you have a good grasp of what's happening at the road surface. Inside the RX300, you'll find all the luxury items you've come to expect from Lexus. There's a really neat trick dash, a six-pack CD player that's housed in the glove box, which means you don't have to go rummaging around in the back. The gear lever is actually mounted on the center console, and above the whole lot, there's a small TV screen. Now this thing displays both climate control and audio functions as well as a trip computer. So what's wrong with the TV screen? Well first of all, the trip computer is next to redundant and the other thing, it tends to wash out in bright sunlight. 
The one area the RX300 isn't shy in is the rear seat environment. There's ample leg room, plenty of headroom, in fact lots of stretch out space. So should the RX300 be on your list if you're in the market for an SUV? Well it very much depends what you want to do with the vehicle. If you're looking for a luxurious four wheel drive that's got more in common with a wagon, the answer is yes. However, if you want to do anything remotely adventurous where you're going to need a low range gear set, the answer is no. Although the unveiling was less than spectacular, the star of the Detroit Auto Show was without a doubt the new Volkswagen Beetle. It's, uh, we've been waiting so long for this, not like weeks, like years. So it's like relief, I guess, and just a great feeling that we can have this car back again. You know, I've been with this company for 35 years now, so this is like deja vu for me. The concept car was introduced at the 94 Detroit Auto Show, but many doubts remained as to whether Volkswagen would actually build it. Yeah, I, I guess strictly the Beetle, we, the Beetle finished, you know, then we were thinking about what, what the replacement could be. But, but nobody could, could put it into, you know, so what would that be? And then these young guys out in Simi Valley in our studio just took the idea and turned it into a thing, the concept one. It was kind of neat. This was a very serious decision. I mean, we weighed it up very, very carefully. Because if it's just going to be a very limited demand, it's a huge investment. So we did a lot of research. We really we researched this car in the States for a couple of years. And then we made a decision. Yeah, there was a big leap of faith too. But I guess as we grew with the car, we got more and more confident in it. Built in Mexico, Volkswagen hopes to produce up to 120,000 Beetles a year. Should it be compared or not? Is it, is it well, nostalgia thing it, it will be compared, but I mean, it is such a totally different car. Once you get into it and drive it, the nostalgia lies in the shape, but the rest is just it's a 21st century car. So you can't compare it. The comparisons will just pale. You, if you, I drove an old one the other day, and I mean, wow, you know, how did we live in those days? You know these good old Canadian winters, they turn up at the most inopportune moments. But you know what? That was what made the old bug so special. The rear wheel drive format, rear engine, it stuck to roads like this, like there was no tomorrow. The problem was you froze your backside off on the way to work. You also had to peer through the ice hole that was forming on the inside of the windshield. Well, how does this new bug fare in comparison? We intend to find out. Ever wish you didn't have radiator problems? Ever wish you didn't have a radiator? Ever wish you could sail through mud or snow? Ever wish your car didn't guzzle so much gas? The Volkswagen has no radiator problems. In fact, no radiator. The Volkswagen engine is cooled by air. Can't freeze in winter or boil over in summer. The Volkswagen engine's in the rear. You go in mud or snow. The Volkswagen cuts most gas bills in half. Ever wish you owned a Volkswagen? Our Midas tip of the week concerns vulnerability. The majority of today's cars, some sport utilities, and many minivans are of unibody construction. That means that the body and frame are one. There's many advantages to that. It's light, it's strong, they're good in a crash. There's a lot of good things to be said about it, but one major disadvantage is that a lot of the plumbing that's running underneath the vehicle has to cut between literally a rock and a hard place sometimes. A lot of this plumbing is underneath the unibody cars and it's quite vulnerable or susceptible to damage if you high center the vehicle, straddle a piece of debris on the road that thumps the bottom of the car, or if you hoist or jack the vehicle up in the wrong position, these components can easily be damaged. If you do happen to thump something and feel that bang through the floor of the car, you might want to think about pulling over or getting that vehicle inspected. First of all, check for fluid leakage or any obvious signs of damage to these pipes. If you're losing fluid, you want to get it inspected very quickly because many of these lines are leading to quite critical components. That's your Midas. 
tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 98 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. We've left Switzerland and crossed over into Italy on a gorgeous afternoon. And if you've ever been here, you know how wild the driving can be. I mean, you combine fast drivers with narrow roads and you know the result. In fact, some of the roads are so narrow going through some of these small villages, the traffic has to be controlled to allow one-way passage. All right, it's now time to head to the garage and join a man who never, I mean never, will turn down an Italian meal, and that's Bill. Brad, you're absolutely right. Veal and spaghetti at Mama's, my absolute favorite. I'd have it seven nights a week if I could swing it. And uh, lately, I guess I've been having a little bit too much because I'm pushing 220 now. But that extra weight's going to help out for what I want to talk about this week on this particular minivan. Now, I've put some cargo weight in the back of this GM minivan. And when I get on the back bumper, something interesting is going to happen. In just a few seconds, you're going to hear a compressor back in this corner of the vehicle cut in and pump some air into the rear. That's it right there. It's pumping air into the rear air shocks in this van. It's trimming the suspension height at the back. Basically, it's leveling the suspension back up to give us the same ride height that we had before we added this cargo weight and passenger weight to the rear of the vehicle. Now, when you think about it, this van has seven passenger configuration. You get seven guys my size in the back of this thing, and you've got 1,400 pounds of passenger weight. You add some cargo to it, maybe something on the roof racks. This is a pretty important little feature of these GM front wheel drive minivans that not many of the uh, competitors have. I think it's something that GM should be uh, making a little more of in their advertising. To me, it's an important feature. OK, we've got the minivan up on the hoist now so we can see this system. Right here is the sensor that's involved with this system. It's firmly bolted to the body of the vehicle. And this lever that comes over here is attached to the rear suspension via this rod right here. There's a couple of plastic joints on either end. Now, as we load the rear suspension of this vehicle and the ride height comes down, this lever is going to swing upwards and change the resistance in this sensor. There's the wiring coming out of the sensor, heading over towards our compressor. We can follow it over. Now, if we look over here, we can see the coil spring that's carrying the majority of the weight in this uh, rear suspension system. But it doesn't have to be all that beefy. You can see how compressible that rear spring is. And the beauty of this system is we don't have to have a real husky rear spring because this air shock system is going to supplement the uh, weight carrying capacity of this rear suspension. Now you can see how big and beefy this uh, air shock is. It's probably about twice the size of a, of a shock absorber required for a vehicle of this size. Now there's the uh, airbag that's going to inflate and lift that rear suspension back to the, to the ride height that, that uh, we desire. You can see the flexibility of that airbag. It's quite a durable unit. These things last for a long time. They've been around for quite a while on some other vehicles, and the durability is pretty good. Uh, up there is a the air connection, and when we, when we remo move back here and move this little flap a little bit, you can see the actual electro compressor. It's mounted on rubber bushings, so it's not too noisy underneath the vehicle. And it's got a little weather flap to protect it from being pelted with uh, debris coming off that left rear tire. This compressor has a secondary function. Not only does it pump air into those rear air shocks, but it also supplies air to a Schrader valve up inside the vehicle so that you could inflate a flat tire, uh, pump air into your spare, or inflate uh, beach toys as well. Now, there's nothing new or revolutionary about this kind of a system. GM was using this on the rear of uh, their premium cars in the late 70s and early 80s. Cars like the Riviera and Eldorado had a system exactly like this. But it's a real boon to a vehicle like this because this vehicle's got tremendous cargo capabilities. And obviously, with uh, seven passengers and all their cargo, maybe a boat trailer or something like that, there's a lot of weight that can be added to this rear suspension that these air shocks are going to take care of in a, in a second. So I think this is a really neat thing. And uh, I watch the GM ads for these minivans, and I don't hear them talking about it. I'd sure be talking about it if I were them. Anyhow, before we go, i got an announcement to make. Well, as you can see, our uh, trusty guard dog at the shop, Stella, has had her second litter of pups. Now, two years ago, she had eight pups, and Jim Kenzie missed out in getting a pup out of that litter. But he always told me if Stella had another litter of pups to hang his name on one. So, Jim, we got five little pups. you got to get over here to the shop and pick out your pup and start building that doghouse. But there's one stipulation. The pup will be free, but uh, you got to stop knocking pickup trucks, buddy, because this dog's going to love to ride in the back of a pickup truck. 
Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 98. Well, Stella, we might have to wait until your next litter after Mr. Gardner hears what I've got to say about trucks coming up next on Kenzie's Corner. A recent report out of the United States suggests that if you slam a sport utility into the side of a small passenger car, the passenger car is going to suffer. Well, I guess. The thing that bothers me is that I think this is going to encourage a lot of people to buy a big truck in the belief that they're going to be safer. Well, you know, it ain't necessarily so. Well, all else being equal, when a big one hits a little one, the big one's going to win. But all else isn't always equal. A lot of small cars, I'm thinking of a Saab 900 or an Audi A4, have much better safety technology than most light trucks. Did you know that most minivans and sport utes don't meet the same passenger car safety standards as your sedans do? Roof crush, side door impact, hide rests, all this stuff are not necessarily in the light truck. Now, another thing, have you ever tried to stop a sport utility in a hurry? These things have got brakes on them like the Titanic. They handle like the Goodyear blimp. If you're in a passenger car, it stops better, it handles better, you've got a much better chance of avoiding the crash in the first place, and surely that makes a lot of sense. Which reminds me, the best safety investment you can make learn how to drive. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, they take their driving very seriously here in Luxembourg. In fact, two years after receiving your driver's license, it is mandatory that you take a defensive driving course like this one. Drivers get to come out in their own vehicles. They are taught defensive driving techniques under various conditions. The result, the highways are a safer place to be. It's so simple and makes so much sense, doesn't it? The question is, why can't we do something like this in North America? Well, maybe, maybe we'll have an answer on a future edition of Motoring 98 as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. It's just a much more attractive vehicle than the 9000 was and you have to get past that and then get people in it and they'll see what a great driving vehicle it is as well. I think that the, the styling of the 9.5 will grow on people but I don't think it's as, as distinctive as perhaps it could have been. TSN's Motoring 98 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will and Midas for new, longer-lasting, performance-friction carbon metallic brake pads.